All right. All right, well, it's 7.30, 7.31, so I'm going to get started. So welcome, everybody, to the um, February Sky, uh, February Astro Cafe of Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, in this month's Astro Cafe, we're going to take, I thought we'd take a little uh, uh, trip down memory lane or do some time traveling with uh, Sky Safari in three, three different time periods. Um, we'll go back several hundred years into uh, the early part of the uh, 15th century. Uh, and then we're going to take a trip fast forward into the far future. And then we're going to come back to the uh, 18th century uh, and uh, a night of discovery. So to do this, I'm going to be using Sky Safari. And I'll be sharing the Sky Safari screen. And so you, if you want to see me speaking at the same time as the shared screen, you need to adjust your gallery view. Uh, and select my or pin my view if you don't want to see everything else. Okay. And I will spotlight uh, this video, my video for everybody that might help you see. Uh, can you, I assume everybody can see the Sky Safari screen? Jay? Yes, I can. And there's a couple of people in the waiting room too there, Luca, you may have to admit. Got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the evening is, uh, we're in the year 1610, January the 7th, uh, in the first hour of the night, and we're in Padua, Italy. Orion and the waxing gibbous moon are rising in the east, and Jupiter is in Taurus, about halfway between Elnath and Eldebaran. And at that time, peering through his newly improved 20 power homemade telescope at the planet Jove, which we know as Jupiter, Florentine astronomer Galileo Galilei notices three other points of light uh, near the planet. And uh, you can see this here is a Galileo scope, which was produced uh, for IYA back in 2009. And so this is approximately the size of the telescope that Galileo used at the time. All right. So he notices three points of light near the planet. So I'm going to approximate the view here. Sky Safari. This is the circle represents about the field of view uh, that uh, Galileo would have seen through his refracting telescope. And uh, not sh I, I turned off surface markings and, and a lot of labels just to make the view easier to see. So at first, Galileo believed the three points of light beside Jupiter to be distant stars, but observing them over several nights, he noted that they appeared to move in the wrong direction compared to the background stars, and they remain near Jupiter, but they changed their positions relative to one another. He later observed a fourth star near the planet with the same unusual behavior, and by the 15th of January, about a week later, Galileo correctly concluded that these were not stars at all but rather satellites orbiting around Jupiter, providing strong evidence for the Copernican theory that most celestial objects did not revolve around the Earth. And a few months later in March of that year, he published these, his discoveries of Jupiter satellites and other observations in a book called Siderius Nuncius, The Starry Messenger. And this was the book that uh, garnered him fame, garnered him basically tenure, uh, with the Medici, but also eventually landed him in trouble uh, uh, for certain views. But we're going to take a look at the first few of the observations as he would have seen them. So here we are, January 7th, in the first hour of the night, as he noted in his, in his uh, logbook, the first hour of the night being the first hour or so after sunset. 
and he sees Jupiter in the midst of what he thinks are three fixed stars forming a striking pattern parallel to the ecliptic. So we advance uh, a day to January the 8th, about the same hour of the night. At this time, uh, he actually missed seeing uh, Callisto, but at this point, he thinks he's recording the movement of Jupiter relative to the three stars he saw the previous night. And this puzzles him because Jupiter appears to be moving in the wrong direction. At that time, the uh, direction of travel of of the wandering stars, the planets, was well known. Next night, uh, there were no observations, but on the 10th of January, this was the view. And after being in the middle of it and to the east of it now, Jupiter is to the west of this star pattern. Unwilling to believe that Jupiter zigzags like this, Galileo concludes that the stars are actually following Jupiter. Note that his telescope isn't capable of separating Europa and Ganymede or Jupiter and Io. And if you can see, we'll just zoom in now a little bit. You can see how one of the moons is really near the limb of where it says Jupiter on the screen. Two of them are really close together, and there's Callisto at near the bottom. So if we recenter the view and zoom out again, you can see some of the points are disappearing, right? And really only drew. Uh, the two points of light uh, on the lower left of the screen. So that was January the 10th. Next night, Jan January the 11th, Io, Europa, and both of their shadows are transiting. They're passing in front of Jupiter. Galileo's scope, telescope is incapable of seeing this, right? You can see, we zoom in, there's, some, there's the uh, satellites and their shadows. Next night, uh, on the 12th, one hour after sunset, uh, and then later in the third hour, Io and Callisto are still hidden by Jupiter's glare. I, uh, sorry, uh, one hour after sunset, Io and Callisto are still hidden by Jupiter's glare. So you can see them very close, but they might have appeared like this. And if the glare of his uh, telescope uh, made Jupiter appear bigger than it really was, you wouldn't see those two points. Io emerges two hours later. In the third hour, a little star not seen at all earlier began to appear. And this almost touched Jupiter on the eastern side and was very small, recorded in his notebook. 13th of January, Galileo is able to see all four moons for the first time. Just zoom in a little bit. The word Jupiter kind of obscures the view, but this is what he looked like. Uh, on that evening. And then we move ahead to the 15th of, of uh, January in the third hour, two days later. Now the four moons are well spaced and easily distinguished. You can see them all lined up on the one side of the planet, two close in and two further out. Galileo notes at this point that like, like planets and unlike stars, the moons don't twinkle. This distinction was well known for at least as far back as Aristotle's on the heavens, and now it supports the idea that the moons are solar system objects and not stars. So this was the first series of observations uh, that, that Galileo made with his newly improved telescope with Jupiter, and he first saw what we now call the Galilean satellites. Um, and there were many more uh, observations uh, for the rest uh, of the month and into the subsequent months until he published Siderius Nuncius uh, in, in March uh, of that year. So these, this is uh, basically the first time that a human-based observer was able to deduce uh, that not everything uh, revolves around the Earth. So now we're going to go back to the 7th of January. And we're going to change the time increment to 
hours. Oh, excuse me. To point three hours. And we are going to go and orbit Jupiter using the orbit function. We're going to go take a look at uh, what these linear motions looked like uh, when we're near Jupiter. End up orbiting quite close. So we'll zoom out. Give me that a little bit more. So you can see Jupiter in the middle, two points of light on the left, one on the right. And we are facing Jupiter on the, from the sun side. So we're seeing it face on fully lit. And we will play. So what he observed from night to night, the changing positions of the moons were really caused by the moons moving in their orbits around Jupiter. So with this, with, with Sky Safari, you can tilt the view and watch them go around and watch as the, up, the ones that are going above Jupiter, watch what happens. They blink out temporarily and come back as they go into the shadow of Jupiter. And uh, we will, can look at almost at John, you can see that they're almost all in the same plane, but they don't always go in front of Jupiter, sometimes a little bit above, sometimes a little bit below. And we will go back to uh, January 11th, at about 1400. And now we're going to go almost edge on, change the time increment to I went, we took a little too long. Watch come back and you can see as the moons go in front, you get the animation of the shadows of the, gal of the two of the satellites as they transit, both the um, moons transiting as well as shadow transits. These happened on one of the nights as he was observing uh, Jupiter or on one of those uh, days. But of course, uh, his telescope was not powerful enough to be able to see this kind of action. So we'll go back and we will exit and come back to Earth. So that was a key period back in the year 1610 that really started observational uh, visual astronomy. Now we're going to uh, change time frames and go to the far, start at the, start at the present time and go to the far future and take a look at uh, the North Star and the other wannabe stars that want to be Polaris. So currently Polaris is the North Star and it always appears due north in the sky to a precision better than one degree. And the angle it makes with respect to the horizon uh, after correcting for refraction and other effects is equal to your latitude, right? And that's also better than one degree. So it serves as a very, very useful indicator for due north, and it will be nearest the North Celestial Pole in the year 2100, and will thereafter uh, become more distant from the North Celestial Pole. So now I'm going to turn off the Galilean view of the telescope that we had, and we are going to go to Edmonton, Change the uh, the time.
to midnight for today. All right. All right, I forgot to do one thing, excuse me. Go to the... Uh... So here's the view at midnight tonight, looking north towards the North Celestial Pole, which is at the center of the view. Now we'll zoom in and see that Polaris is right, is, is not very near the Celestial Pole, but not quite. And we want to go about eight degrees field of view. Now we change the time increment to one year, and we'll play this to the year 2100. So in this animation, you can see Polaris is gonna get a little closer to the pole till about the year 2100, and then it'll begin to drift away. So as we get past this time period over the course of Earth's 26,000 year axial precession cycle, because the Earth's uh, axis of rotation actually does wobble, a series of naked eye stars in the Northern Hemisphere are gonna hold the transitory title of North Star. While other stars might line up with the North Celestial Poles during the 26,000 year cycle, they aren't necessarily bright enough to serve as a useful indicator. There's going to be periods of time in the cycle when there is no clearly defined North Star. There are also going to be periods during the cycle when bright stars are just near North, as they may great, they may, could be further than five degrees away uh, from the North Celestial Pole. So we're, we're actually living in a fairly special time right now, which Polaris is quite close. It's fairly bright and easy to find. And so you can always really tell where North is. So now we'll zoom out a bit. To here, change the time increment to 10 years. And we'll play. So we've got Polaris highlighted and you can see as the years advance in this, anim in this uh, rapid animation, it's drifting further and further away uh, as the North Celestial Pole drifts further away from Polaris. We'll stop around the year 4,000. And you can see there's a star called Eri that is at the, the, the roof of um, the house shape, uh, this, the, the house shaped constellation of Cepheus. And as we advance now to the year 6000, it's going to appear uh, near, it's going to drift further and further in towards the, uh, the house through the roof. And right around the year 6,000 or so, it's on a line between Beta and Iota Cephei. So if you can see the Cepheus constellation and you notice the triangle, 
that's where north is uh, on the right hand line. So we keep going to V year and it keeps drifting through. And now it's going to start heading close towards a brighter star, Alderaman. That's one of the brighter stars in Cepheus, and so that'll that'll serve as a useful indicator there. Now we keep going. Now the north, now Cepheus is drifting away. But you notice how uh, Cygnus is basically now almost fully circumpolar. And there's Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus getting closer and closer, and it's going to get to within seven degrees at about the year 10,000. So that would be the situation. You see, see Deneb and uh, look down into the left a bit, and you will, and that's north. So that's a near north. We keep going. You can see Lyra, quite circumpolar. And in the year 13,000, it's about as close as it's going to get. So you see Vega, look down a bit, there's your north. I think I'll jump a little bit uh, slightly faster, double the speed. Okay. You can see Hercules is circumpolar now. A dim star got near there. There's M92. You see M92, you're looking north. Oh, and so again, a fairly dim star, show you north. But if you see the keystone and look up to the right, you'll see it. Up to Then we get to a, a, a star in Draco. Three point three magnitude star. And if we keep going, we get to Tuban or Thuban. Three point six. These aren't these. None of these stars are as bright. It takes quite a while before we get to uh, uh, another uh, fairly bright star. And towards near the end of the cycle, as we get back to uh, closer to Ursa Minor, and around the year twenty four thousand, there's Kokab there near the North Celestial Pole. And as if we keep and if we keep going, you can start to see the Polaris is coming back uh, into the picture. So I will stop this animation at about twenty seven thousand. You can see Polaris is back to being the North Star in the far future. However, take a look at the little dipper. And take a look at Cassiopeia over on the right. Right, there's Navi, there's Kokab. Due to proper motion of stars, these two particular uh, constellations 
have noticeably changed their shapes uh, from what they are today. It's a long cycle. The uh, North Celestial uh, Pole drift around these uh, various stars, but it, but the, but none of them really will match the brightness and accuracy that Polaris has uh, for serving as an easily identified true north indicator. So those are the shapes due to proper motion. If I just press now to go to today, you can see they're back. There's a, there they are. You can see that they're back to their normal shapes. So that's a little tour of uh, into the far future. And now we're going to go back uh, in time again uh, to the 18th century. There's little doubt that uh, William Herschel was the most significant astronomer. Oh, I better stop. There's something on the chat. Okay. Oh, all right. Uh, there's little doubt that William Herschel was the most significant astronomer of the 18th century. His accomplishments included the discovery of Uranus, infrared radiation, and four planetary satellites, as well as a compilation of two extensive catalogs of double and multiple stars. His most lasting achievement, however, was his exhaustive search for undiscovered star clusters and nebulae, a key component in his quest to understand what he called the construction of the heavens. So for this little uh, time travel trip, we need to uh, change where we are and when we are. So we'll go, we're going to go to Bath in England. And we're going to go to the year 1785, April 11th at about 9.45 p.m. Bath, England is about uh, two degrees further south latitude than Edmonton. So the sky looks fairly similar. We'll go to the south southeast. Go in a bend. So you can see. Leo high in the south southeast at that time in the evening. In at this time, Herschel's time, astronomers were mainly concerned with the study of solar system objects. The search of clusters and nebulae up to this point was pretty haphazard, a total of only about 138 having been recorded by all observers in history. Even the celebrated uh, astronomer Charles Messier responsible for the discovery of 40 of these, he regarded them as nuisance objects that should be avoided when searching for comets. Because that was a big deal back then. By contrast, Herschel systematically searched for nebulae using the most powerful telescope in existence up to that time, an 18.7 inch speculum reflector that he had built. Between 1783 and 1802, he surveyed on over 400 nights, conducted 1112 sweep observing sessions and cataloged 2,500 separate objects, all of them original discoveries. He surveyed almost the entire sky north of uh, minus 33 declination and published three catalogs of objects in 1785, 89, and 1802. And these catalogs were the forerunners of Dreyer's new general catalog of nebulae and clusters, uh, which we now know as the NGC catalog. William's telescope, a so-called large 20-foot, was ready in the fall of 1783, but because he worked alone and the instrument was somewhat difficult to, to use, the initial results were disappointing. So he modified his search uh, by setting his telescope up so that as a transit, basically pointing it in one direction and not moving it uh, from side to side. So he aimed it at the meridian, which is would be things that are crossing his field of view would be at their highest elevations for that evening. He hired an assistant to slowly raise and lower the telescope up and down about two degrees, uh, while the sky's diurnal motion uh, brought new stars of field uh, into the field of view. And he used an eyepiece that provided a magnification of about 157 uh, and a 15 minute field of view. And each of these observing sessions was called a sweep because he was basically sweeping a swath, a vertical swath, a swath of the sky 
a horizontal swath of the sky. A typical night would do three or four sweeps uh, that were usually interrupted by passing clouds. He also employed his sister Caroline to record the positions and other details of the discoveries he made at the eyepiece so that way he could stay at the eyepiece uh, without having to move uh, away from it. And fully half of Herschel's discoveries were made in two years, 1784 and 1785. He and his sister Caroline observed on every clear night, even when conditions were far from ideal. He often discovered a dozen objects in a single night, and some nights he noted more. By the spring of 1785, he and Caroline had closing, were closing in on a thousand new objects. But on April the 11th of 1785, they enjoyed a night of discovery that never approached or has been equaled in the annals of visual astronomy. The final tally was remarkable. 74 objects recorded in a marathon session with 70 newly discovered galaxies. So here's a fun fact. There are 7,093 independent objects in the NGC catalog, eliminating duplicate entries or non-existent objects and entries associated with single, double, or multiple stars. Fully 1% of those 7,000 plus objects were discovered in one night, April 11, 1785, by one of the greatest visual observers of his time. And ably assisted with by his sister Caroline, because without her, he couldn't possibly have achieved uh, this, uh, this feat. So here we are looking at the sky from Bath, England on the evening of April 11th, about 2145. Leo's high, riding high in the southern sky and Orion and the waxing crescent moon are setting in the west. And so you, we're gonna use the observing list uh, feature of uh, Sky Safari to bring up the Herschel Sprint. And then we're going to uh, set up a field of view that simulates uh, what he would have seen through his speculum reflector. So I'm gonna set up a finder view, two circles, and we'll just to pick up this object here, right? Center that. We're going to zoom in to the first part of the sweep, NGC 3196. So this big circle you can see is a typical uh, 8 by 50 finder view. And the smaller circle uh, right around the little circle of NGC 3196 is the uh, field of view about half a degree, about twice as wide as, he would have had, as Herschel would have had, but at about 150 power, uh, simulating the type of magnification he was using. Now we go and set the time increment. To 0.2 minutes. So NGC 3196 um, is actually the toughest of the objects, the 16th mag galaxy. Um, and throughout the sweep of that evening, there were clumps of objects and gaps in between. So we're going to start the animation here. And if you start here, you aim your telescope, um, just to say a note about finding where we are, you'll see we're just above the sickle of Leo. So you can see the sickle quite easily in your finder. There's Ad Farah uh, near the bottom there. So if you put your finder where Ad Farah is in the middle, all you'd have to do is pan up with your finder, NGC 3196, which you won't be able to see, just uh, uh, put to put it in the middle, just pan so that I'll, at Hera is down. I'll just center it. You can see that Ad Hafera would be just outside the finder view. Off to the left, you can see all the, high, all the objects that would have been discovered. So I'm gonna make the circle about the size of the finder and we will animate. Something's wrong.
I think you're tracking. I'm not tracking. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Uh, didn't follow my script. <laughs> didn't follow my script. This is what happens when you try to demo something, right? Okay, I know what I did. Oop, I don't want to cancel. All right, I selected NGC 3196, so it's trying to lock in on that. So what I, we have to deselect that. So now it will play. And you can see as time goes on, and we're gonna stop it at about 11 p.m., the first few NGC objects come into view, and by 11, you've seen a, the most, most of, a, of a certain uh, clump of objects. And so, as these, these, take, these take a while to pass through the view of the finder, but as you see the star patterns come in, you could zoom in, right, and then go up and down. And as these pass, you'd go up and down, trying to see if you could see these, um, these objects. And of course, every time you look through the finder, you can reestablish where you are by just noting the star pattern and, and moving the, and the finder so that those particular stars are are visible. So we keep going and we'll stop at about 1130. And this is near the end of the first clump of objects that would have been seen. In fact, if I go to right to 30, you can see there's right, a couple on the left, which would appear, right? And a couple on the right, so we keep going. So now there's a, after 11.30 or so, you get a gap, but then you start around, just after midnight, you are starting to get into a, quite a crowded area of objects. Your coma berenices as it's coming into the field. So if we stop at about uh, 20 or 30 minutes after midnight, you've entered a pretty crowded field, and here, if you really wanted to try and see as many as, as you could, you really got to get busy because as you go in, you could, you could go up to here and then swing over, maybe down, swing over. And so this would have been his approach. He would have been sweeping up and down at about this kind of a power, looking for objects, right? So sweeping, sweeping like this, I don't see any, I don't see any. Oh, there's a few to record. Maybe see it like that. Call a call out uh, the positions with respect to stars and uh, and the uh, descriptions of these objects. So they would have been numbered with uh, local numbers to the current list they were working on before they got the NGC numbers. And you go up and down, sweeping like this. Keep going, and. We'll stop it at about uh, here. Famous uh, star pattern of Coma Berenices becomes uh, visible. So you can always uh, uh, get your bearings with this one, although it is a crowded field for uh, objects. And if we stop at about Here, we're really in a busy field. So with the finder, with crosshairs, you could be positioning across all of these. And then in, in the eyepiece, you might be able to see. Of course, Sky Safari shows many, many more objects that he, that he didn't see. And eventually you get to, as that major clump goes away, now we're at 1.30 in the morning by about uh, getting some close to uh, two in the morning, you get, you get far less objects, but you do come across M3, which would, had already been noted at the time Werschel uh, was doing this particular sweep, but this would be a good time uh, that you've 
to stop and have a good look because this will be m3 is brighter than anything you've seen so far uh, in this sweep so we've been at it now about four hours and a lot of the sweep uh, is done in fact if you zoom out you can kind of see where we are we're now getting close to booties um, right and then and then in the rest of this sweep as we keep going you can see that the rest of the sweep uh, nothing was noted uh, for that evening but after a long gap till about three in the morning um, is when the last ones were noted. I'll just stop it there and we'll just kind of cruise. These are the last ones that would have been seen in Corona Borealis. Two, uh, thir a 13th and a 14th magnitude uh, galaxy. So coming up in a couple months in April of this year on, on the 11th, if you're interested, an, an interested observer could repeat Herschel's night of discovery on its 236th anniversary. Sunday, April 11th, 2021, will be under a new moon. And in fact, any clear night around April 11th would also work. And if you don't want to spend the entire night doing the sprint, you could have the advantage of actually moving your telescope more easily if you don't want to spend the whole night. But you could, uh, if you want to uh, read about the objects while you're waiting for them to pass and just let the sky bring them into your view, uh, so then you can go up and down the way Herschel did in his sweeps, that would be an interesting way to do, a, to do a set of observations and seeing how many you can see. I remember he was working with an 18-inch speculum reflector. So how many would you be able to see? So about half of the objects are, are uh, between 10 and 12th magnitude, and the other half are 13th and 14th magnitude. An eight inch scope will get you about half of them, although they could be diff uh, some of them could be difficult. And a 10, a 10 inch scope would get you significantly more, but a lot of them are quite dim, even, even, with, even if you can see uh, something at 13th mag, they're not necessarily uh, easy depending on uh, your sky viewing conditions um, and just, well, it is a new moon and of course you will need to be in a dark path. England at the time of 1785 was not very light polluted. If you try this in Edmonton, you, uh, will, you will be uh, sorely disappointed. So you really do have to get out to a, a dark night, a uh, dark area to be able to see it. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how many you're able to see. I did this last year, last April, uh, out at, at the uh, Black Nugget Lake uh, dark site. Um, and it was quite fun to be able to let the, uh, the Barry Arnold, I did it with a Barry Arnold 18 inch telescope and it was quite fun to let, uh, just put the Dobsonian, uh, turn the tracking off, get it lined up and just wait for the objects to come in. Um, and that telescope is tall enough that I actually had to go up and down a ladder uh, for it. If you, if you lose, if you, uh, if you can't see them all, or it's taking too long to do your sweep yourself, to do the sweep yourself, all you have to really do is just reposition the telescope and keep going. Uh, Herschel didn't have this advantage because it was just too difficult to move it. Uh, and it, uh, it didn't really have much side to side motion and to get it to break point anywhere significantly different uh, was a big operation. So once it was fixed in place, this was the, the main method that he used. And so it's, you can recreate the observation. It's kind of neat to be able to see them uh, go through the field uh, using Sky Safari uh, uh, for animation. So that's our little trip uh, through three time periods. I'm going to stop this for a second and go back to Zoom and stop the share. And uh, so that's. Um, Three little tours I thought might be interesting to uh, uh, to see this evening, and um, if you have any questions about any of the three or on any uh, Sky Safari type uh, functions, I'm happy to answer them as to the best of my ability. Um, since we have uh, at least another 15 minutes before the nominal end time of this Astro Cafe, so if you want to talk about anything, just unmute yourself and join in. 
That was neat, uh, Luca. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I, for the 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 North Pole one, um, I, I've always just seen it in a. You know, here's the circle representing the um, the loop of the stars that would eventually be um, uh, around the pole, but right. I've never seen it animated with that sort of. You know, spiraling out and others slowly spiraling in. So that was quite cool. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah, that was it was kind of neat. I, I had seen that circle animation myself and uh, wondered, hmm, is there a wonderful what wonder what Sky Safari can do with the time controls uh, and the play button, right? So it's kind of interesting to be able to do that. The trick with all of these is to find the right time increment in the right unit. <laughs> and it isn't always one. It's usually some decimal of something between a year or anywhere, you know, between multiple of a year or down to the minute. Because if it goes too fast, it's just, uh, it gets annoyingly dizzy. Yeah. Um, so, Which uh, version of Sky Safari are you using, Luca? I'm using Sky Safari Pro, the, the okay. top level uh, version on Android. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I, I don't know if you can do, I think you can, because you have to be able to select time and date, I think the time controls are available in the other versions as well. The big thing okay. about the Pro version is the extended catalogs as well as uh, telescope control wirelessly. Right. right. You should be able to do these uh, animations yourself. And I haven't tried it. I've been, I was meaning to do it, but I ran out of time. There is a free version of what amounts to be like a light version of Sky Safari put out by, by Celestron called uh, Celestron Sky Viewer or something like that. You can, you can find the app on the, Android, on the Android store and iOS stores, and it's free to download. Even You don't even need a key to unlock it, having bought it, if you bought a telescope, you can just use it, um, and it might and they might have the telescope controls in there. So if you don't want to spend any money and just try it out. You might be able right. to use right. Sky Portal. Um, and right. Be, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember I, getting it when I got my uh, Celestron. Yeah. Do you know if it has the time controls? I haven't used it okay. for so long that I can't remember, but I remember getting it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite good. It's made by the same people that make Sky Safari, and they did it under license to Celestron, and the Celestron just puts it out. But it it doesn't have any scope control features. It doesn't have the audio tours. It, it, it it's quite cut down. But in right. terms of basic uh, sky charting, uh, it works. It works as it works as well as any version of Sky Safari. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Another interesting one you can do is uh, select Barnard star, make sure proper motion is turned on, and then animate that through the years. And you don't have to go very far to see that it's a different position. I mean, you can do that. You can do that in real life, but if you want to see what it's going to be like, maybe in a decade or two, you can easily do it. Uh, you can't do any uh, proper motion stuff outside. Like the, uh, it's limited. It's quote limited to the galaxy, right? Outside the galaxy, you don't get this uh, proper motion stuff. And even then, at the far periods, like at, when we were at 27,000 years looking at Ursa Minor and uh, Cassiopeia, I'm not 100% certain that that's an app, that those proper, like the proper motions are going to be based on certain, what, certain parameters we know today and then just extend it out over time. But as we know, um, those motions are often um, changed over very long, long periods as things get perturbed. So those shapes would not be what we see. They won't be the same shapes as we see today, but I'm not sure that those would be the actual shapes in the year 27,000. But it's close enough to demonstrate that they won't look the same. Like if you look at Orion, on the other hand, in that, at that same time period, it doesn't look any different at all. Even the Big Dipper, you'd have a hard time seeing uh, the changes, but they're really noticeable in the Little Dipper and Cass. Yeah, I mean, it, it took um, essentially measuring instruments for them, for them, as in Halley uh, or Holly, 
uh, as in Edmund Halley, the comet guy, um, for him to see the proper motions of Arcturus and, and a few others. Um, the, uh, the, the movement of the stars is really slow and it takes you know, 2,000 years plus a decent measuring tool uh, to uh, note it. Right. And you can, yeah, you, you need the, um, what is it, the astrometric eyepiece. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I read that Hipparchus had noticed the uh, Earth's axial precession. So was that, I guess it was that apparent in, in the span of a lifetime. Well, it, yeah, and it's, it's roughly uh, one degree for 70 years. Okay. Which... So 35 years, half a degree. You know, you'd hardly call that noticeable because, you know, it's the... Uh, and it's one of those things that I've always felt I've, I've missed out of my education, um, where it's the... Um, you know, the the it's the equinox that has shifted by a half degree and and it's the you know it's like how do you measure that Oy. With, with you know quadrants because that's all they had <laughs> mm -hmm. they were much more patient <laughs> and uh and careful i guess careful recorders somehow yeah. that maybe there were they, maybe they were there were things they could use that didn't move or they know they always could trust their positions maybe of certain things that were built for that purpose rather than just something like a pole but maybe some stone structure that says okay this is not going to move on us and we will use it in this certain way so that we can establish our viewing position at the same time right so I mean, just like I try to set up a camera on a park bench over the course of a year and try to recreate that position every time, it's fraught with difficulties. But I think if you put your mind to it and you can control the environment where you are, maybe it's it's just not something that you, that we really that we think about. But back then, you, a lot you have to be a lot more uh, had to have a lot more ingenuity, I think. But yeah, I was surprised that Hipparchus. It was said that Hipparchus had noted the axial precession, but as you said, a degree every 70, half a degree is the width of the moon, right? So yeah, you can measure that even if you're using your finger, even if you are using a, a, a thistle of known length or, 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 a, or a piece of papyrus of known diameter or something like that, right? There's your, there's your measuring instrument. Yeah. Or a, peep, a sight tube maybe, uh, I don't know. Uh, what was that uh, astrolabe? How old is the astrolabe? I forgot. I know. I think uh, Ber uh, Berta told us about that, but I've forgotten how old the astrolabe is. I think it's sort of five hundred ish AD. Okay. The the uh, origin was mostly with the um, the Moors. Right. There probably were precursors. Uh, well, there's that Antikara mechanism that they mm. think is the. Uh, big planetarium that's right on gears yeah um, okay um any other comments or questions about sky safari and the animation or uh, things like that from anybody okay i'll get to a couple of announcements um since we're on a Wednesday night, and just have to just bring up a website here, or our website. <laughs> Next week, uh, one week from today, Alistair is going to present Introduction to Stargazing in the Universe, part of the Wednesday series once a month that uh, leisurely works its way through the uh, getting to know the sky and potentially working your way through the Explore the Universe uh, certificate program. Mm -hmm. If you go up, right, and then uh, a week, and then uh, March the third is What's Up, Robinson, where Jeff Robertson will preview what's happening in um, March skies over Edmonton, and I will just mention one last thing here for Astro Cafe itself. 
The next Astro Cafe, which will be on, uh, of the series, will be on March the 17th on Astro Imaging Community Cafe. So Abdur is going to be uh, rounding up uh, some presentations for Astro Imaging Techniques. The April Astro Cafe uh, is currently in, uh, doesn't have a, a, a speaker or topic yet. So if anybody here is uh, wants uh, has ideas for something they'd like to see on Astro Cafe uh, in April on the 21st, uh, let me know. You can email astrocafe at mtenariasc.com. Um, and then in May will be our next how to use a telescope. Uh, and so that one we hope to be outdoors because it should be nicer. And we maybe we can even do it in person, maybe with some distancing. Uh, if not, if it's too problematic, we'll do it again via Zoom because the last one um, on January the 20th worked extremely well where 13 uh, people with telescopes got one-on-one -on -one help uh, through uh, Zoom breakout. All right, well, thanks everybody for attending. That's it for this evening's Astro Cafe. We'll see you soon. Oh, well, thank you for the presentation. All right, take care. Good night. Thanks.